All right, welcome. My name is Chris Rubio, and today on The Rubio Method, we'll be talking about traps, massages, basset hounds, hogs, tragic loss, all of that, and much, much more on The Rubio Method. Big T, let it rain. Focus, focus up. All right, welcome back to the Rubio Method. Obviously, make sure you are sharing the RubioMethod.com website, YouTube channel. If you have any questions for myself, Monahan, or our guests, please just go to the Rubio Method contact page or email us directly, Rubio at the RubioMethod.com. Monahan, let's start with a fantastic website question. This question was given to us by Debbie. It is not my mom. My mom's name is Debbie, but this is not her. It would be a little bit odd if it was. So let's just go with it. Ready? The question says, Ready to go. how do I get my man to practice more self-care like we gals do? Massages, lunches with friends, and learning to, to appreciate each day more. Monahan, I'm going to go first on this one. I'm telling you right now as a dude, this is a trap. If my wife told me this, I would 1 billion percent say, in my mind, I wouldn't say it out loud first. I'd say, this is a trap. She's trying to trap me into something. She's testing me 1 billion percent. Monahan, do you agree or disagree with that? Man, every time I get hit with something like this, it is a T-R-A-P trap, trap, trap. I will not be falling for it. <laughs> I mean, I think the only way you actually could do it is if you actually said, hey, I swear on everything. This is not a trap. I really want you to put, pull down your guard. Go have some fun. Go play some golf. Go have some beers with your buddies. Go hang out. Go play frisbee golf. Do whatever you got to do. Just this is not a trap. Because if you do not say it's not a trap, they're going to think it's a trap. One time my wife and I agreed we're not going to do Valentine's Day gifts and all that good stuff. We go to dinner that night. Okay, blah, 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 blah. All of a sudden she pulls out a car. And immediately I started to get, so I'm sort of sweating right now, just thinking about it. She's, and I, <laughs> what's going on? And she goes, where's my card? And you and I said, you said no gifts, man. And she said, a, a card is not a gift. A card is not a gift. And I said, you said gift. I'm going with gifts. So my, like what I said before, this has got to be made very, very, very clear. Monahan, final statement on this. Yeah, absolutely. Also, just, just, <laughs> I know joking around, but. To, to get your man to do more self-care, just tell him, like, it's not a wimpy thing to do, and self-care and self-help is good help. So I would say, man, just reach out to your man, be sincere, and let him know that it's good for you, there's no trap, and just enjoy his day. Monahan, you always do such a good job of bringing me back to ground, like saying, okay, Rubio, tone it down, land the plane a little bit. Here's what you actually could say as a quote-unquote professional, so I appreciate that. Moving into the next segment, Monahan, have you ever heard my scooter story in Mexico? Oh, my gosh. I've heard so many stories, but not the scooter one. Let it rip. <laughs> All right. I'm going to loosen up for this one. <laughs> so my wife and I, I don't even think, I'm not sure if we were married, dating, engaged, whatever. We go out to Cancun, Cozumel, Playa, one of those Mexico resort-type places. I, matter of fact, I think we were dating because we were still in like the, the swooning stage and all that. And it was the first time oh, yeah. we went it, on a uh, trip and met up with a bunch of her friends. And we met up with a bunch of her friends. And I was extremely nervous because I'm trying to woo her as much as I am them. Any guy that has a wife or girlfriend knows you get in with the friends and the family, you're getting in very well as well because they're all talking about you as soon as you turn your back. So we decide we're going to do this one day a little excursion. And the excursion is we're all going to rent scooters, okay? Scooter, not a big hog-type motorcycle. We're talking maybe this thing's going 30 miles per hour, 40 miles per hour with a normal-sized human being of like 150 pounds. I don't know what the normal-sized human being is. So we decide to go down there and rent them. Now, let's just say the scooter and the equipment are not exactly top-notch, all right? These are not OSHA-approved. Literally, a fifth grader would not approve these things. I put on the helmet that barely fits my big head, and the straps are literally just rusted and disgusting. So as I'm basically even walking, they're flapping like a basset hound, and the ear just hitting me. And so I, I, God knows I'm going to have a tetanus shot after this whole excursion. So my wife looks at me, and she knows that I'm not, let's say, an adventurous man. I've said before that I'm more safe and sane, not dumb and dangerous. 
she looks at me and says, Rubio, do you know how to ride a scooter? And immediately, my machismo kind of puffed up. Like, yeah, I know. Of course I know how to ride a scooter. How? Yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> Truth is, never rode a scooter. Never rode a motorcycle. About a, a pedal bike was about as much as I've ever done on two wheels. But I'm not letting her know. I'm not letting her friends know that I could not do it. So I get on it, and I immediately... I'm looking at everyone else riding their scooters because we're all doing these little test runs. I have no idea just to make sure that maybe the possible the gas tank or wheels don't fall off because these are not the best pieces of equipment. Go to strap up my helmet, give it. I can't because it's like I said, the Basset, Russet, <laughs> Basset Hound, rusty ears just flapping in the wind. And I do one of these or one of these. I can't remember because I've never ridden one of these. Never, ever, ever. So I'm boom, almost like Papa Wheelie. And it's, as it is, I'm heavier. So it's immediately doing the automatic Papa Wheelie. My wife kind of looks at me and says, all right, Rubio. She actually does call me Rubio, for those who are wondering. Uh, let me drive. I, go, I got it. I got it. And, you know, stick my chest out a little bit more. Like, don't worry about it. I got this. I got this. It's no big deal. All right. So everyone's ready. We're the last ones to take off from the starting line. We're just going to go straight about 100 yards, if that, maybe 100, 100 feet. We're going to make a right, and then we're going to just kind of cruise along the, the bay or the ocean, whatever, the ocean front. So we're going. And I get about 30 feet from the intersection. And this is the prototypical movie Mexico intersection. There's like roosters over here. There's a burrow over here. There's federales here with, you know, machetes and guns. This intersection is packed with people. And I'm coming up to the intersection. My wife is sitting on the back. And I got this thing throttled. And immediately I go, okay, we got to make a right. So I'm going, going, going. And in my mind, everything starts to slow down. Because I can't figure out this quick, when you make a right on a scooter, how do you do it? Do I lean? Do I pull? Do I drop my foot? I have no idea. So all of a sudden, I kind of press the gas, press the brake, lean and pull all at the same time. And I start in the middle intersection, which I swear to God was like wet marble somehow. I start falling. And I'm literally yelling, I'm going down. I'm going down. And she goes, what, what do you mean? And jumps off. She jumps off in the middle of the intersection. I crash this thing in the middle of the intersection. All hell is breaking loose. I am pinned under this hog. My wife runs away, so she's not even associated with me. She's my girlfriend at the time. Runs away. I'm like, I'm stuck. I'm trapped under this hog. Someone needs to come get me. All of a sudden, you can hear one of the wives of our friends say, Rubio's trapped under the, under the scooter or whatever it is. And you can hear one of the husbands, how? Because I could still hear it. It was one of those distinct things where you could hear it, even though there was so much commotion. Thank God they came over as my wife was doing whatever, came over and lifted the scooter up off me. I get back on. I'm holding on for dear life. I literally walk it, you know, like a third grader walks a bike across a crosswalk. I get across into the curb, basically, area, get away from the boroughs fighting and all hell's breaking loose in this Mexican intersection. My wife gets on. She goes, do you know what you're doing now? I go, yeah, 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 yeah. I, don't, I know what I'm doing. She'll stop right there. She'll let her go. Right. But no, I was too macho, too dumb, too ignorant. We proceeded to go around the entire island. I was white knuckling so hard, hard that my forearms were shaking and stressed out and literally sore by the end of the day. But we made it all the way around. It took everyone else about an hour and a half. It took us, I think, four and a half hours. But we did it. Monahan, we're going to get your reaction right after this commercial. Big T. Let it rain. Unlike other health concerns, mental illness is not always easy to see. D E P R. Mental illness doesn't show up on a scale. Bipolar? Sorting out a mental health concern takes professional diagnosis and treatment. Anxiety. I thought so. If you or a loved one has a mental health concern, don't go it alone. For 24 hour free and confidential information and treatment referral, call 1 800 662 HELP. Learn more at samhsa.gov slash support. Here's to the straggly ones. The first ones. But hey, I look good with this ones. The black, brown, red, and gray ones. The itchy ones. The ones grown by dad. Right. The ones grown for dad. The I nearly didn't do it this year ones. And the absolutely filthy ones. They all raise awareness, raise funds, start conversations, and save lives. Because whatever you grow will save a bro. Learn more at Movember.com. Focus. Focus up. 
All right, welcome back to the Rubio Method. Make sure if you have any questions for us, you can email us directly, rubio at therubiomethod.com, or simply go to the contact page on therubiomethod.com. Monahan, wh where did I go wrong in that story? Man, there's so many ways that it went wrong before he hit, had Queen hit the eject on you there. <laughs> <laughs> Man, but I think the biggest thing is something that us men really, really struggle with. First off is asking for directions. I, will, I refuse. Um, <laughs> but second yeah. is, man, us men really are afraid to ask for help. And we're really afraid to look like we don't know what we're doing because society and, and, and as we're taught growing up, we're taught, hey, you're a man, you're a leader, you know everything, away you go. And then what happens there is you wind up ejecting in the middle of a Mexican intersection. <laughs> So how do we break that mold, Mon? And how do we do that? How do we get our kids? Because you're having a kid coming, you know, in three months. I've got a 20, 20 year old, a 19 year old, and a 10 year old. How do we break the mold of, dude? It's okay. Ask a question. The world will not end. Yeah, absolutely. I think even just being leaders and being like, hey, it's okay if you don't know what's going on. That doesn't mean you're any less of a man. That doesn't mean you're dumb. And that doesn't mean that that you're just you're you're an idiot. It means that. Hey, like you're smart enough to ask for help. And that's one of the biggest things that we even talk about as men's mental health is a lot of times we're afraid as men to, to look weak, dumb, uh, or what have you, to ask for the help that we need um, to, to, to make sure that we, we're going in the right direction. And I think one of the big things with that, Monahan, is when you're out with a big group, you're always going to have certain people that fill certain roles. You're always going to have the super macho guy. You're going to have the, the kind of not as macho guy, then the kind of nice guy, and then maybe the kind of dweebish guy or weakish guy or whatever. At that point, I should have looked around at my audience, whether it was husbands or wives, and been able to decipher exactly, all right, probably shouldn't ask that guy. He's just going to mock me, and I don't want to hear it for the rest of the day. Maybe that guy, that's the guy I could ask because there's always one in every scenario where you know they're just a little open-minded in a good way, and you, I could have just loved to say, hey, man, i got to be honest. I, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I need a couple quick tips. Do you have any suggestions? A am I wrong, Monahan, or am I right? You hit the nail on the head because that's exactly it, too. Find someone you can trust. Find someone that you don't mind confiding in. That way, again, you don't find wind yourself on the, on the side of the road, right? So find someone that you can trust that you think won't judge you. That, hey, walk up to them and say, hey, man, I need help. I need to help. I need help figuring this out. And they would be open to, to what you're asking and open to helping you out. And then you guys both are better off for it. Yeah, and then you're more in cahoots. And honestly, in, in hindsight, there's one more way to look at it. I could have just leaned into that whole thing, not just the turn, but obviously just leaned into the whole thing and just looked at Jolie, who you know I call a queen, just say, hey, I got to be honest, I got nothing. I'm, I'm about to get, I mean, we're either going to crash or I'm going to literally just let you dr drive, ride, and I'll just take the heat and just say, yeah, man, I got nothing. I'm my bad. And I do that a lot now out here, and I don't work. I'll say, I, I got nothing. I don't know it, but in hindsight, I'll, I can drop you guys off in Lewiston. I'm going to drop you off in L.A. And I'm going to just drop you off there, and I'm going to say, good, good luck, because I can do it there, but I can't do it here. So there's always the flip side. So, Monahan, is, is that okay, too, is just as a man to say, I, I got nothing? Yeah, that is so okay, man. And people, honestly, that wouldn't be okay with that, man, they're not your friends. They're not people that you can trust. Like, if you're around people that know, love, and care for you, Almost any situation is going to be okay. Just talk to him about it. Absolutely, absolutely. As always, if you have any questions, you can contact Rubio at therubiomethod.com for myself or Monahan, or you can go to the contact page, Rubio at therubiomethod.com. Let's hear a little bit from our sponsors. Let's help those that help us. Big T, let it rain. Thank you. Thank you. Focus. Focus up.
What's going on? Welcome back to the Rubio Method. We have a phenomenal guest. I'm very excited about this. He's a great, great guy. I've known him for a long, long time. I don't even exactly know exactly how we first met. I just He's one of those guys that I feel like I've always known. All right, today we have Brandon Huffman, lives in Seattle, Washington, graduate of the UCLA Bruins, National College Football Recruiting Editor at 24-7 Sports, Founder and Executive Director at Avery Huffman DIPG Foundation. Huff, what's going on, Daddy? Dude, it is a beautiful day. No, it's not. It's a great day in Seattle. I just assume this is an evergreen statement to make. It's probably not pretty outside. It's probably a little slight, slight drizzle, just that constant mist of Seattle. Yeah, which would be great if it was 95 degrees outside, not when it's 35 degrees outside. I hear you. Huffman, we're going to start with three quick hitters. Three quick questions. We don't want you to think about them. Just kind of break the ice, and we're going to go from there. We may have a little tiny bit of banter on each one. Depends on where you go with it. But I just want to real quick, don't think. Ready? Here we go. Three questions. Number one, who's the best overall athlete of all time? Rod Woodson. Oh, who's Rod Woodson? Oh, Mich Michigan guy? What? What? Rod Woodson, the oh, greatest there? defensive back in NFL history, the greatest player in NFL history, the greatest Woodson of all, not just no. a member of the All-75 anniversary team, not just a member of the All-100 anniversary team, but an All-American track guy in college as well. Deion you're Sanders, legit telling me he's he better take... than Bo Jackson? You're, you're saying he's better than Bo Jackson? No, I'm actually going to say it's Kobe Bryant, but I just knew that Rod Woodson would wake everybody <laughs> up. Okay, okay, okay. I respect okay, right. I respect that. Just, just look I over my left you. shoulder, and you will see who the greatest athlete of all time is. Okay, too soon. Number two. <sighs> Way too soon. Best, the, best pizza you've ever had? Whew. I would say it was from a – it's going to be stereotypical, but I was in New York City for National Signing Day about seven years ago, and I happened upon one of those little, like, two ninety nine dollars joints – Two big fat yes. cheese slices, fold it, grease everywhere, destroyed my stomach. It was magical. So good. That's the best part about New York is that you can literally just go into almost a gas station and find phenomenal, phen phenomenal pizza slices. I've heard you can do the same thing with barbecue in the South, that you can just like literally roll into a gas station and you'll have phenomenal, phenomenal barbecue. You can get 5,000 right, calories answer, right? for like eight bucks. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm so in. If you could move any other place besides Seattle, where and why? San Francisco. Why? That's a no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's it's San Diego. I mean, who would not want to? I, San Diego. I'm all about just trying to get. Make sure you guys are paying attention. I'm all about San Diego. Oh, I'm paying attention. When I, I San it. Diego followed by Bend, Oregon. Only reason I would take San Diego over Bend, Oregon is a they have more breweries. B they have the Pacific <coughs> Ocean and not just a lake. Yeah, I, I get you. Too many people for me nowadays, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to it. All right, Huffman, let's get to the meat and potatoes of this interview. You, I, we're, you have a massive, massive sports background, and for everyone that wants to talk about sports, this is not going to be the interview to do it. We're not going to cover it. There's too much bigger topics that we can cover. And one of the things that I think brought you and I a little bit more close together, closer together, um, this is a very, very touchy subject, a subject a lot of people – will just say, Ruby, I can't believe you brought it up, but the way you brought it up to me is overwhelming. We're, I'm going to let you go in on it. I'm going to let you start on it. But the way I heard about this, the issue with your daughter Avery, was you had a tweet, and I was talking to Monahan about it, and I, I believe the tweet said, this is the hardest piece I've ever had to write. Am I, am I correct yes. on just the title? Yeah. Okay. I, I, and so I, I clicked on it. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it, it was that was it. It was the most difficult tweet I've ever written, or the most difficult piece I've ever written is this one right here. And then, boom, the bomb was dropped. And so I click on it because I follow you, follow me, and I'm reading it, and I'm reading it, and I'm reading it. I'm trying not to get emotional. It'd be very hard this episode. And I was like, like it felt like an elephant was sitting in my chest, and I was like, this cannot be real. This cannot be real. This cannot be real. So, Huffman, please ex explain to us what – that tweet was about and what just start us off yeah so june 30th 2015 uh, my wife Amanda and i took our daughter at the time six years old avery 
to an ophthalmologist to get what we thought was just a, a routine uh, eye check. She had had over the course of a few days, right at the end of the school year, she had developed a cross eye, thinking it was just something that was correctable. We took her to an ophthalmologist, thinking that maybe he'd see what was wrong, maybe put a patch over her eye, get her some glasses. Everything's great. The prior to that day, so the 29th was when we had the first appointment with the doctor. The next day, he said, I want you guys to come back in. I want to do an MRI. Not knowing anything about ophthalmology or about how eye issues are, we thought an MRI was routine. Took her in for an MRI. That day, sat with her for 45 minutes as she st stayed underneath the uh, MRI machine. My wife was in the lobby. I was back with her, not knowing that this MRI was going to change her life and going to change our lives immensely. My wife not feeling right about the doctor saying, hey, you know what, we'll get the results back in a couple of weeks. She was adamant, hammering the doctor there saying, we need to get the results now. They sent us back to the ophthalmologist's office from the MRI place. We went over to the ophthalmologist. The doctor came in and said, oh, Avery, you've been so great. You've been so brave. And then he turned and looked at Amanda and I and says, but she has a tumor. Immediately, every breath in my body went out of my body. I lost any ability to talk, my mouth went dry. I'm not exaggerating. That's literally physically how I felt. Well, I, I, was I can only imagine. The floor. It, it, was, it was stunning. So I'm in a daze. My wife's mom was with us. My mother-in-law was with us. The doctor tells us, I want you guys to drive to Mary Ridge Children's Hospital in Tacoma, and they'll give you more information there. So in that 30-minute drive, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, tumors happen all the time. There's benign tumors. There's malignant tumors. This is a benign tumor, right? This, is, this can't be anything catastrophic. My dad had a benign tumor when I was a kid. No big deal, right? We get into the doctor thinking, okay, they're going to tell us that she's going to need to have surgery. She may not get to do much this summer. There's probably going to be some, you know, some therapy, but everything's going to be fine. As we sat in yeah, the doctor's office. Goal. Yeah, I mean, it was a, a, a minor, what's the phrase? A minor setback for a major comeback. That's all this was going right. to be to us was a minor setback. And about five minutes before the news was given, one of the nurses came in with a child life specialist and brought Avery a wagon and put her in the wagon and said, all right, Avery, we're going to walk around the hospital. Avery thought that was great. Immediately, I knew something was up. But again, still thinking, okay, surgery, that's what she's going to tell us. This is what's going to happen. She just doesn't want her to hear. The doctor says four letters that I know in the alphabet, but I had never heard in this order. The doctor says, Avery has a tumor. It is a cancerous tumor known as DIPG. And I said, okay, what does that mean? Well, she explained what DIPG meant. It's diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, which is a glioma. Not having any context at all of what cancer was, having never personally been greatly affected by cancer. I said, okay, well, when do we get the surgery to have it removed? And that's when the doctor just had a very grim look on her face. She said, so there is no surgery that can be done on this particular tumor. I'm like, well, then how do you do it? Is it chemotherapy? Is it radiation? How, what removes it? And then she gave me an even grimmer look. The estimated time for her here will now be six to nine months. And I'm thinking six oh. to nine months in the hospital? And Amanda just shrieked. And she said six to nine months is a life expectancy with somebody with this tumor. Three hours before, we thought it was going to be, we need to get her a new pair of glasses. Three hours later, we're now being told on the last day of June, hey, if things go well, you might have your daughter till the end of the 2015. If things go really well, you might have her till March of 2016. But this isn't going to end well. I went home. How? how okay, at, this, at this point, at this point, Brandon, how, how your wife is shrieking. Are you just at, literally just you're looking at yourself from outside? There's no way you can even comprehend what this is happening to a six year old girl who you uh, thought was just going to get an eye patch and glasses, you know, bandage it up. Yeah. Here's some more extra vitamin D. We'll see in September. Everything's going to be fine. How, 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 how do you do that? I mean, because I've been in a similar situation, not even close, but what did you do? I'm getting teared up. What, what did you do? Yeah. In, in the middle of this all, I had a big bottle of water that I had grabbed from the from the car when we went into the hospital. And I had already downed this thing like three different times, kept filling up with – this is how desperate I was. I was filling it up with faucet water just to keep myself hydrated because my mouth was dry from the anxiety and the nervousness. In the middle of the doctor telling us I had to excuse myself to go throw up in a bathroom because I could not believe what I was hearing. All while I'm just – it was just water I was throwing up, but I had upset my stomach so much. So I went back in and I sat in and she's explaining this to me. I'm just like, 
what in the hell is happening right now? This, this cannot be real. This, this is beyond the thought of any parent ever to even think about something so grim, a prognosis so terminal, so lethal at such a young age, especially when we thought it was just an eye issue. And as I'm yeah, sitting there trying to and, process and, and, this. And you thought it was just an eye issue. And it, the thing is that we have photos that you sent us that we're going to make sure get up on the screen for everybody. Six-year-old and the total time frame. And it wasn't just an eye issue. As we progress through this, I, I don't want to expedite this at all because I want everyone to hear all the details. But it was a transformation. I mean, a complete not just for your family, but for Avery. And I remember just watching this and it was just, every time you, uh, I can't even get through it. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and it's, you know, it's funny you bring that up because after I processed this all, I went home to, to our other three kids and just kind of said, hey, everything, we're at the hospital. We're going to be there for a day or two. Just relax. We'll talk to you guys when we get back, but just, you know, relax. And I made the mistake of coming back to the hospital. I made the mistake of Googling DIPG. And then I hit images and all I saw were children with these faces that were puffy and from the tumor. And I'm thinking, what is that from? What is this from? I got to stop looking at this coming to find out that steroids are basically their lifeline during the growth of the tumor during radiation. And then obviously with steroids comes an increased appetite. So these children were normal sized children before they got sick. And then because of the steroid use, because of the ramped up appetites, they're gaining 20, 30 pounds. Avery weighed 39 pounds when we checked into the hospital on June 30th, when she was given her diagnosis. Her last doctor visit when we were, when she had her second brain surgery prior to her going on hospice, she weighed 79 pounds. So she more than doubled her weight because of steroids and just the weight gain from it. So it's a physical transformation. It's a mental transformation. It's an emotional transformation. She went from being the kid that was running around in the backyard to within a week, having to rely mostly on a wheelchair to get her around because half of her body just stopped working. She was right-handed, but basically from the head down, actually from the neck down, her right eye worked fine. Her left eye was the inverted eye. But then she lost the ability to use her right arm, the right leg. She had to learn how to write left-handed. And everything just changed dramatically just within days. And it was incredible how lethal this was. And then on the top of that, you're trying to balance your other three children who at the time, you know, our oldest was 11, our son was nine, and our youngest was four, trying to explain to them what's going on with your sister without telling them the prognosis just keeping them informed on the diagnosis and then just kind of as time necessitated filling them in on what more they needed to know well and that, and that brings me to the obviously this shows about men's mental health and men's health how this is you're being bombarded i mean you're being shot all over the place here from a million different arrows how in the hell did you manage your own health at this point and still being the father figure slash the husband figure when this is all happening. Well, I'd love to say that I manage my health well by going on runs and going on walks and on jogs, but <laughs> you know, I can joke about it now and I joked about it at the time. We immediately had friends in our community who had a meal train coming for us and we had a meal train for the essentially seven months that she fought cancer and about six weeks after. So my health was going the wrong way because everybody in our community decided to make a casserole each night. It was either enchiladas or lasagna. The occasional person would make us barbecue ribs if it was summertime. But what do I do when I'm not feeling good? I just go in the kitchen and eat. And I laughed about it at the time because Avery was never a big eater. She was a picky eater. She liked vegetables. She liked certain vegetables, but she wouldn't eat other vegetables. She liked certain fruits, but wouldn't eat other fruits. But all of a sudden, her appetites and her cravings just dramatically multiplied because of the steroids. So she would feel bad. Dad, you know, I, I, my face is getting puffy, but I'm hungry. I say, well, Avery, I'll eat with you. And I would use that as my excuse to say, okay, cool. You're going to have two racks of ribs. I'm going to have two racks of ribs. And <laughs> I was doing it to feel better about what the situation was. She was doing it because the doctor was there. So physically, I was doing all the wrong things in terms of just overeating. But mentally, I've never been a guy that's been a, a cry for help type of guy. 
But if it's made available, I'm not going to turn it down. And there was a dad who lived about three miles from us whose daughter died at the exact same age Avery did, had the exact same disease Avery had. She was diagnosed at the exact same age. And, and turns out that her one of her teachers ended up being close friends with our friend who developed the entire mill train and had a connection there. So they got us in communication. He would say, listen, you're going to be pissed. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be angry. And you should be all of those things and then some. You're going to question your decision-making about the medical treatment. Don't question things. If you made the right, if you make a decision for her health, you made the right decision. Don't question your decision-making. And it was almost like, and the other ticket was, he was originally from Ventura County too, who happened to live in Washington, like me. His parents lived in Santa Paula at the time. At that point, my dad had moved to Santa Paula. So there were some con connections there where it's like, okay, dude, this guy's me five years older. And mm -hmm. he would just say, listen, I'm a phone call away. We'd get together and just sit there and like talk about, there's two big guys. He was an ex-Army Ranger, made me look puny. And there would be the two of us at a restaurant crying, talking about our daughters, but it was therapeutical. So I had that side of it. But we'd be crying over a plate of mozzarella sticks and buffalo wings <laughs> at 11 o'clock at night. Huffman, one of the things that you've done phenomenally on throughout this entire process, and, and I look forward to it every single week it comes out, tell, tell everyone what Avery Tuesday is. Yeah, so Tuesday was the day that we first noticed something wrong with Avery's eye. The following Tuesday was when we got the diagnosis that she had brain cancer. She died on a Tuesday, February 16, 2016. A week later, she was laid to rest on February 23rd, 2016. So there are four Tuesdays. All were among the most devastating days of our life. The day she was diagnosed, the day she died, and the day that she was put into the ground. Instead of letting Tuesday be a day that we lamented and resented and regretted, probably two weeks after she passed away, I told the man, I'm like, we need to do something about Tuesdays. Why don't we call it Avery Tuesday? And every Tuesday, we'll share a picture of her with a story. It might be a funny story. It might be a sad story. It might be a, st a story of just how tough she was. It might be a story of what a turd she could be at times. But it was a day where we shared about Avery. Because when you lose a child, your biggest fear is that people will stop talking about them. That everybody else gets to move on with their life, but you don't get to. And your child becomes nothing more than a memory and the picture in the back of her school yearbook. So you want the legacy to live on. So we said, we're going to take Tuesdays back and make it our day to honor Avery. And that's what we've done for probably ding near 300 and plus Tuesdays since the day she passed away is that we have made Avery Tuesdays our day to share about Avery. I always wear an Avery. You see my shirt right here, an Avery shirt. I wear some form of this every Tuesday, no matter what. And we always make it a point to just share a story about Avery. Some tug at the heartstrings, 350 people comment on them. Some are just like, okay, well, they were just going through the motions. And there's some Tuesdays where I just feel like going through the motion, where it is emotional. You're going through pictures and you're like, gosh, this sucks. I don't feel like writing anything deep today. But but I love the fact, I love the fact that you said you don't want her to just become a memory. And I've always said that when people pass, whether – it's, you know, I don't have any experience like you do, but, you know, a family member. And I always said, it bothers me, like my mother-in-law recently passed away, that, yes, obviously I'm upset she passed away. That was terrible. She was a phenomenal, phenomenal human being. I always said, it bothers me more that my kids don't get to experience her more. And that's exactly what you're trying to do with Avery is say, no, 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 you're going to keep experiencing it, man. Every Tuesday, you get ready and help. And how, how do they sign up for these uh, letters? I mean, it's simple. You go to AveryStrongDIPG.org. There's a link to the Caring Bridge. So we use Caring Bridge as, a, as an avenue to share what each of our medical updates were. But that's where I post her Avery Tuesday every Tuesday. If you go to our Facebook, AveryStrongDIPG, our Instagram, AveryStrongDIPG. Um, we're on Twitter, too. Each of those places, we share our Avery Tuesday for everybody to see. And, and Chris, you made a great point. Like, you know, you don't get to experience certain things. And as the girls in, in her classroom, they're in seventh grade now. They're getting, you know, they're, they're getting bigger. They're getting older. They're supposed to be going to high school in a couple of years. They're supposed to be doing all these kids stuff. And, you know, Avery's permanently forever seven. We don't get to experience those things. So it's kind of like, all right, well, this is our way of experiencing that. And, and it's incredible to have people in our community. When her class would have graduated eighth grade, 
one of her friend's moms bought us one of those lawn graduation lawn ceremonies said class of 2020 at Lakeland Hills Elementary School Avery Huffman and it was in our lawn and she put it there without even telling us for a few days we had no idea who put it there but I cannot tell you what that meant to our family oh, to not know idea. who did it just to see it because that was the thing we feared what are we going to do next year when she's in fifth grade and everybody else's lawn has their kid's name but we don't see Avery's and we never verbalized it somebody just thought I bet that that would mean something to them and they did it and it does because that's what we want oh, yeah. we don't want people to forget her we want people to remember her one of the things about your journey through all of this was you obviously made it very, very public, which it, you, more power to you. I'm not sure how I would have done it. It was obviously a, somewhat of a coping mechanism for you. It, 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 you had to do what you had to do. One of the main, main things that I can't even get through the entire film, I'm get, getting messed up a little bit, think about it. Tell me how the Frozen video came to be. And I, I'm hoping that we have the ability to get it up on the screen for everybody. The most incredible thing. So... Avery loved the movie Frozen. Her favorite character was Anna. Uh, her younger sister's favorite character was Elsa. And they had their matching costumes. And they would play Frozen scenes throughout the house. We were supposed to take her to, you know, to go see the movie about a year and a half before one weekend. And my dad was supposed to take her. He had a stroke that weekend, couldn't take her. So I ended up taking her to the, or I had planned to take her to the movie. And then I said, you know what? I need to do something else. Why don't you go with your mom? That's something moms are supposed to do. I had never actually seen the movie, but I knew how much Frozen meant. So fast forward a couple weeks. We kept talking about how much she loved Frozen. These are the things that she did. I get an email, and it was the day of my birthday, and it's an email, from, and I have no problem sharing this guy's name. Many people in football know the name Steve Clarkson. He's the, the legendary quarterback trainer uh, that's been training quarterbacks forever. His son, Steve Clarkson Jr., who's actually more of a soccer fan. He, he's one of the non-football playing sons. Uh, of, you know, his, his younger son, Pierce, is going to Louisville to play. His older son, Anton, is a, is a football coach. But, Pierce, uh, but Steve Jr. is a soccer guy. But Steve knows the right people. And so Steve said, hey, here's an email. Just listen to the, to the message that we have for you. And he had set it up so that Kristen Bell – who played Anna in Frozen, called Avery, left her a message, said she could not believe how brave she was being during her entire fight. She named her brother and her sisters. She talked about all the different characters, and then she gave her the title of Honorary Princess of Arendelle. So knowing that technology, I'm pretty savvy at it, but Caring Bridge did not offer a way to share the video. I put it on YouTube just so I could have the link into the story. Mm -hmm. After about three days, there was maybe 150, 200 views. Well, three, four days later, I get a message from my sister, and she said, hey, did you know that Avery's story is on Entertainment Weekly? I'm like, how in the world did that happen? Somebody had shared the video, a fellow, a UCLA alum, had actually seen the video that was posted, sent it to a contact of theirs. Within days, it had been seen by over 2 million people. It had gone viral. And she was doing news stories around the Seattle region. And then it reached a fever pitch. When she said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I'm on Google. And <laughs> just her childlike excitement of being on Google, when we were on her Make-A-Wish trip, we were getting off of one of the rides at Epcot Center. And a lady from across the park yelled, is that Princess Avery, the honorary princess of Arendelle? And Avery's one eye that was covered with the patch couldn't see, but the other one got as wide as it possibly could. And she came up and told my wife and I, she said, I'm from Ohio. I saw that whole story. I loved everything about that. And I cannot believe that I get to see Avery here. And she looked at Avery and said, Princess, you are so brave. And Avery was just all in her glory. But all it took was Kristen Bell, who was a mom, who, who had kids of her own, knowing that something that small and innocent could change Avery's life. And it, and it really did. And the smiles that it brought her, she, you know, you go on YouTube, it's still there. Two and a half million views later, you know, she was just completely touched. Our whole family was completely touched by what Kristen Bell did for her. Oh, I can't, I can't even get through it. So, so good. Uh, we're going to get the video up. Go ahead. Ready? Hi, Avery. This is Princess Anna of Arendelle. I just wanted to call and say hello. So, hello. hello. <laughs> I hope you're having a great day and playing a lot with Hoppy Jumpy. I love bunnies. Hold on. What's that, Elsa? Oh, wow, okay. I'll tell her. 
Um, Avery, my what? sister Elsa says she's heard that you've been such a good girl and that you've been so brave. She has decided to crown you as an honorary princess of Arendelle. <laughs> wow, that's so exciting. I think you'll make a great princess. Well, I gotta go build a snowman with my friend Olaf now. So, would you tell Addison, Alex, and Kate that I said hello? Okay? All right, bye bye. Huffman, final question. You gave us all the website, all the information. What advice do you have for any parents going through anything similar? Because obviously, you've gone through literally the worst thing possible a parent can do, the heck they can have to go through. What, what advice do you have for anybody? You know, uh, the, the best advice that I can give, and I still give it to this day, is, you know, your weakness is a strength. What I mean by that is if you're making yourself vulnerable, showing the weakness, the, the, the sadness, the pain, the hurt, that's showing that you're strong. You don't have to, to disguise it. You don't have to mask it by trying to say you have it all together. It's okay to be hurting. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be miserable. And I did that. I'd sulk every single morning, and it would be interrupted by Avery saying, basically, Dad, get your attitude under control. I have a list of things that I want to get done today, and your sulking is cutting into my list accomplishing time. But when she'd go to bed, there would be that time to just be like, I cannot believe this is it. So it's being willing to let when people say, hey, if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. Don't be too good for that. Don't be too big for that to say, no, nah, there's nothing you could help me. Just having somebody that will listen to you is something that's big. And Amanda and I have made it a pact since the day Avery died that if other families go through this, whether it's DIPG or another form of cancer or they just lose their child prematurely, to make ourselves available to just be sounding boards, to just listen to them and let them get their frustrations, their anger, their hurt, their pain, their stories out because it's okay to be weak. There's people coming alongside of you to give you that strength, to get you through it. You're not fighting it alone. So be open and, and willing to let people listen in because it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be weak. Showing that weakness, showing that vulnerability doesn't make you soft. It shows your strength that you're willing to let other, know, other people know, gosh, guys, not everything is going well. Huffman, if I was next to you right now, I'd give you the biggest bear hug. We'd go belly button to belly button, and I would not be the first to let go, my man. I really appreciate all your time. Um, one, rip, one quick more time. Quick, one more time. Please give us the website again. You can go to our website, AveryStrongDIPG.org. All of our social media channels are at AveryStrongDIPG. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm not sure how we could incorporate it into TikTok. I'm not even going to try. I'm too old for TikTok. <laughs> but our website and those other three social media channels, you can learn more about it. You can read our Avery Tuesdays, and you can read about the bravest kid that I've ever met. Thanks again, Huffman. Really appreciate your time. Big T. Hey guys. Let it rain. Here's to the straggly ones. The first ones. The, hey, I look good with this ones. The black, brown, red, and gray ones. The itchy ones. The ones grown by dad. Right. The ones grown for dad. The I nearly didn't do it this year ones. And the absolutely filthy ones. They all raise awareness, raise funds, start conversations, and save lives. Because whatever you grow will save a bro. Learn more at Movember.com. This is what too much sounds like. This is what stress feels like. And this is what help feels like. If you've lost a job, worry about your next meal, or have trouble making it through the day, we can help. Text STRESS to 211211 to find a solution. Focus! Focus up. All right, welcome back. My name is Chris Rubio, and you are watching The Rubio Method. Remember, if you have any questions, you can contact, contact us directly, rubio at therubiomethod.com. Go to the contact page at therubiomethod.com, and obviously you can see us on NGBN TV, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and definitely, definitely, definitely our YouTube channel for The Rubio Method. Monahan, we had a little break. What did you think of Huffman? <laughs> Man, I thought he was incredible. Um, his story is so impactful and so powerful. 
Um, I love when he said, your weakness is strength. Uh, men, I'm yeah. looking at you. Your weakness is strength. I love how he said he had a one buddy that he reached out to, and he was able to let it all out. And he was not too tough to let it all out. Because the other thing really quick, too, is no matter what your situation is, find somebody. It doesn't have to be to the extreme. But if you're going through it, find somebody to confide in. Well, yeah, and as bad a situation as, as that is, as that was, I always have this saying where you're not the first to do it and you're not the last. And you won't be the last. As bad a situation as that was, and you, you would think, oh, my gosh, I'm the first person to do this. He found that army buddy that was like, hey, man, I've been there. I've done that. Let's talk it out, Daddy, because this is going to be extremely rough and just crappy. And he definitely needed that someone to lean on and, would you say, Monahan, just kind of listen to. Yeah, you need a sounding board, you know, like, and that was that was Brandon's sounding board. Um, and I love that he he went into depth with that because it is so important to have someone that you could you could be weak with, and it's okay. Let's move on to the final segment. This was a great episode. We're going to talk about the bottom line. Remember, very black and white human being. That's why the logo looks so black and white because it is. I'm a bottom line guy. Tell me what you want. We're going to solve it right away. Here's the three things that you should have learned from tonight's episode. Number one, it's okay to admit you don't know everything. Case in point, me on the scooter. Probably should have admitted that a lot quicker. I wouldn't have fallen down in front of the roosters, the burrows, and the federales and been pinned under that hog. Same thing with Huffman. When he, he, it's okay. His army buddy said, you don't know everything. Just sit down. Shut up. This is going to be a terrible, terrible, tragic ride. But we're going to go on it. Monahan, do you want to add, add anything to that? It's okay to admit you don't know everything. Yeah, it is okay. And, in fact, you might learn something when you admit you don't know anything. <laughs> Number two, it's okay to let others lead when they should. Huffman had to let other people lead. Doctors, his army buddy, his wife at the time, the food little train rolling around with all the casserole and lasagnas. I should have let Jolie lead. I should have let literally anybody else lead would have been better than me crashing that hog on that wet marble. My hand thoughts. Yeah, man. If you could be a leader and you feel good in the situation, go for it. But if you feel that fit in your stomach and you're like, maybe I should uh, pull on back before I hit the eject in the middle of the intersection, go ahead and do that, man. And the third and final one. Create something new to push you into a better spot. And it might even help others if you are lucky. This is a perfect example of what Huffman and his family had to do. They were in a terrible, terrible, tragic situation. He, they created the Avery Strong label, the app, the website, the Avery Tuesday, all that to help them get through it. As he said, he still has days where it is just terrible. Certain days he gets through it. Certain days he just goes through the motions. But I definitely think, Monahan, that he went, he created he had to create something new to get moving in the right direction. Yeah, any t anytime you can reframe a tough, tough, tough situation to be one that, I'm not saying you're getting positive out of it, but uh, some of the, a smidge of positivity out of it, man, I love that because you never know, it, it, it could help others out. I shoot, even hearing that story, it helped me out. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'd love that. Reframe the situation. That was a great, great way to end the show, Monahan. You did fantastic. We want to thank our guest, Brandon Huffman. Huffman, excuse me. Make sure you check out AveryStrongDIPG.com. Always, if you have any questions, you want to contact us, Rubio at the Rubio Method.com or just go to the Rubio Method.com. Check out the website. There's a contact sheet right there. And definitely, definitely check us out on any way you want to, how you listen to and view podcasts. Big T, let it rain.